This morning on our continuing series, Forever Young, A Guide to Life After 50, the story of a man who's quietly spent almost a half century photographing the faces of his neighbors in Buffalo, New York. His name is Milton Rogovin, and as Bob Dotson reports, at 93, Rogovin has finally earned the kind of attention he deserves. In this small Buffalo, New York neighborhood, just six square blocks, Milton Rogovin is recording something rare. Families aging over 30 years. You know, he doesn't look for your outer beauty and none of that stuff. He looks for the person you are. Rogovin lets his subjects choose their own poses and backdrops. You don't pretty up your pictures? Never, never, no. Why not? By showing these individuals as they are, they were actually speaking out, and uh, this is what I wanted to do. Ever since his father lost his dry goods store in the Great Depression of the 1930s and died of a broken heart shortly thereafter, he has been drawn to the hardworking, hard luck, and just plain hardened of society. When I met Milton, I was a full-fledged addict. Andres Garcia is now vice president of the company that runs the neighborhood's health clinic. Extraordinary. He recorded the history of not only people, but of a community, a poor community. People that they forgot it once. <laughs> Who Rogovin remembers. That's my grandma. No. Returning oh, again oh, and again. Thank you, thank you. It's good to see my you, Milton. Before he began taking pictures, Rogovin was an optometrist with a successful practice on the edge of the neighborhood. Back then, these streets outside his office door were filled with the poor and unemployed. So, he decided to speak out. I was trying to bring the attention of the public that these people should not have to suffer as they are suffering. Yeah. That was dangerous in 1957. Milton was ordered to appear before the House Un-American Activities Committee because of his ties to the Communist Party. Rogovin was shunned. His neighbors wouldn't let their children play with his kids. Customers stopped coming to him for eye exams. So he picked up a camera and taught himself to take pictures. The out-of-work optometrist decided he could help people see in a different way. Blacklisted and unable to find another job, Rogovin and his family survived on his wife's school teacher's salary. To keep busy, he lugged his camera around the world, focusing on people who often seem invisible, earning almost nothing. His work went largely unnoticed, until now. This summer, his old camera and the pictures it made are on display at the New York Historical Society. They are also the subject of a new book. Public radio producer David Isay is one of the authors. These are stories about us. It's, they're about people who get up every day and have struggles and go to work and people die and people get born and time passes and life is lived. <laughs> the country that once scorned Milton Rogovin is now proud of him for preserving what others overlooked. He's one of a handful of living photographers whose life work is in the collection of the Library of Congress. But Johnny Grant is most proud that the pictures Rogovin took are also on permanent display in his neighborhood. When I'm dead and gone, my son, maybe his children will be able to see this and realize we weren't just an ink spot on the wall. And we're important too, even though we may not live under the lights and the cameras all the time. Have you got a favorite picture? <laughs> I mean, what, 2,000 portraits you've got, right? That's just like you asked. <laughs> A mother, which one is a favorite child? Oh, where, where, where are you? That one, Isn't that, oh. that one, and that oh. one. That's my son. He's How there. old is he now? 18. Oh. <laughs> Milton Rogovin grew old watching this neighborhood grow up, sharing the yearbook of their lives. Today, he is 93. Okay, I'm very sorry what happened to you, buddy. His wife and longtime collaborator, Anne, died of brain cancer earlier this month. 
But he is not alone, because his friends, the forgotten ones, have not forgotten him. Yeah, just be a strong, okay? Sure, thank Everybody you. will love you, okay? Thank you. <laughs> For today, Bob Dotson, NBC News, Buffalo, New York. Milton McGovern's photographs are on display at the New York Historical Society in New York City until October 12th. And we're back right after these messages. Eighteen old soldiers will gather this morning in Columbia, South Carolina for a poignant reunion. Sixty years ago today, they volunteered to follow Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle on a bombing raid over Japan, knowing they would have to ditch behind enemy lines with no hope of rescue. NBC's Bob Dotson tells their remarkable story. Memory is too fragile a thread from which to hang history. Most of us no longer recall or have ever heard of the Doolittle Raid. But it changed our world as surely as 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. The raid commanded by Jimmy Doolittle. On this morning, 60 years ago, 80 volunteers were about to do the unthinkable. Everybody had said they'd go, and uh, I guess I was too big a car to back out. Nearing 90, Jake DeShazer is one of the few who can still tell the story firsthand. On April 18, 1942, DeShazer was an Army corporal, standing on the deck of the aircraft carrier Hornet, desperately trying to keep his bomber from sliding into the sea. And a big wave came up, and the front end of that airplane went way up there, and the tail end went down. There's nothing to stop it. Sailors came running with ropes. One of them, next to DeShazer, backed into a spinning propeller and lost his arm. He looked up at me and he said, give him hell for me. The men were setting out on a secret mission to bomb Japan and give America its first victory of World War II. They said uh, over the interphone, if you can't get your motor started, we'll shove them off in the ocean. No one had ever launched a bomber in so short a distance, 450 feet. My pilot, uh, Bill Farrell, said, um, Jake, do you, can you row a boat? The planes soared over Japan 500 feet above the ground. DeShazer, a bombardier, dropped his load near Nagoya, then headed toward the coast of Asia. The bomber flew till it ran out of fuel, and then one by one the crew bailed out. DeShazer landed on a Chinese graveyard in Japanese-held territory. He and seven other flyers were captured, called war criminals, and sentenced to die. Three prisoners were killed, but DeShazer was spared. I don't know why I wasn't executed. Instead, DeShazer spent 37 months in solitary confinement, most of it sitting in a five by nine foot cell with only a small window above him. In the gloom of that pit, he was given a Bible and read a line that changed his life. Is love your enemy? Yeah, I was. Isn't that easier said than done when you're being held in a pit? <laughs> I thought, boy, uh, Jesus don't expect to love those real mean ones. But uh, it didn't fit because I'd memorize, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. He did more than pray. After the war, DeShazer astounded his former comrades by going back to Japan as a minister. DeShazer stayed in Japan 30 years, started 23 churches, including this one in Nagoya, the city he bombed. They told me to go up there and get a church started. You bombed them, now charge a church. <laughs> DeShazer's story of forgiveness moved one Japanese man in particular, Matsu Fujita, the pilot who led the attack on Pearl Harbor. I was uh, really lost, lost a lot. But his story inspired me to get the Bible. And be baptized in DeShazer's church. The two old enemies spent the rest of their lives trying to weed out the hatred that infests the human heart. How do we get past all that bitterness? You did. We can uh, love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. Does it work? It did for me. DeShazer's life, like the Doolittle Raid itself, found victory in defeat. For today, Bob Dotson, NBC News, 
Salem, Oregon. And by the way, Matsu Fujita died in 1976. His son lives in the land his father fought so hard to defeat. Joe Fujita is an architect in New York City. We're back in a moment, but first, this is Today on NBC. But his victories and the kindness of strangers made an extraordinary difference in his life. Here's NBC's Bob Dotson. Out here on the cliffs of St. Lawrence, Newfoundland, the wind can sound like hell's idea of music. Blizzards blow through in biblical proportions. One of them, in February 1942, bullied the U.S. Navy destroyer Truxton onto these rocks, offering Lanier Phillips a terrible choice. And every time a wave would come, it would wash maybe 10, 15 people overboard. But the 18-year-old mess attendant clung to that sinking ship for five hours because he was sure he'd be lynched if he tried to go ashore. I felt that I was the lowest, the least, and the last uh, because that's the way I had been treated all my life. Phillips had lived a childhood of desperate fear. The Ku Klux Klan burned down his school in rural Georgia. In the segregated south of the 1940s... I had no dreams. I had nothing to look forward to. So he joined the Navy even though the only job the Navy offered a black man back then was servant. Now, dangling above frigid waters, Philip shouted to three other black mess attendants. You're going to die if you stay on board. And ice was forming on all our bodies. Phillips dropped into the last raft. What happened to these guys? Well, they all died. They froze to death. Along with 107 shipmates, but Phillips and 46 others survived because villagers from St. Lawrence rappelled down these ice-covered cliffs. These people took a chance on losing their life to come down and help us. We needed help. Some of them are in terrible shape. Terrible, terrible shape. Levi Pike was 18, working in a mine behind the cliffs. Sometimes you'd run out to get one, and you'd miss them because the sea had drawn them back again, you know. You had to run back yourself then to keep to keep from getting carried away. Phillips, coated in oil, was carted off to a makeshift hospital. Oh, when I woke up, I, I was stark naked. I, and know, terrified. Lot I Kelly and a friend, two white women, were frantically trying to scrape off the oil that covered his body. She said, Lot, you know, I can't get him clean. I can't get him white. And he, he looked up and he said, no. I said, you can't get it off. It's the color of the skin. I was the first black man they had ever seen. A lifetime passed before the old sailor returned to St. Lawrence. Stove was here, bed was back there, and that's where I slept that night. Lot Kelly had sad news. Her friend, who had stayed up all night heating stones to keep him warm, was dead. I didn't even get a chance to thank her for her hospitality. <laughs> or tell her how he'd lived the life she saved. Phillips retired from the Navy after 20 years, but not the sea. He worked for the explorer Jacques Cousteau, helped locate a lost nuclear bomb, later faced down bigots with guns while marching for civil rights. That plunge into these icy waters off the coast of Newfoundland left him fearless. Phillips tells young sailors and soldiers to search for caring in unexpected places. Something came over me. It was etched in my mind that all white people were not racist. Hey, thank you for sharing your story. I really appreciate that. At 79, he believes his life really began in St. Lawrence. The town's mine is now closed. Half the people are gone. But Phillips did something for the 1,600 who remain. Built a new playground with an old sailor's name. When the Truxton collided with the cliffs and rocks, in St. Lawrence, Newfoundland, I collided with my destiny. The man who desperately needed a hand now offered his. These people, they didn't just save my life. That's a minor part of it. They changed it. Forever with a simple act of kindness. For today, Bob Dotson, NBC News, St. Lawrence, Newfoundland. 7.46 on a Thursday morning. We're back right after these messages. 
In the moments after four jetliners crashed on September 11th, all airspace over the United States was shut down, diverting thousands of flights around the world. NBC's Bob Dotson now on the kindness of strangers in one community who took in hundreds of passengers unable to return home. Life in Newfoundland can be as hard as the weather. Temperatures dipping 20 below. Unemployment in some villages hovering as high as 50%. But this remote island in the North Atlantic, Canada's poorest province, has set a mark for giving worthy of the history books. It began last September 11th when pilots were told to put their planes on the ground as soon as possible. Reach 891, Yankee Roger. 38 jets with more than 6,000 passengers ended up in Gander, Newfoundland. Two American Airlines planes were hijacked, both were crashed into the two World Trade Center buildings and were destroyed. Both buildings are rubble. Yes, thousands are dead. Morning. School bus drivers were on strike back then, but they left their picket lines and worked 24 hours straight to take the stranded travelers to nearby towns. You're all going to the same destination? You're going to the same place in Lewis, Fort so you uh... Passengers thought they were being dropped off at the yeah, end of the yeah. earth, but they couldn't have been made to feel more at home. Churches took in those who could not find hotel rooms. Travelers, anxious to know about events, 